Welcome to the Green Vision Summit and Expo in Malta. This is a huge event where we have three days full of fantastic speakers. It brings us great joy to gather global leaders, policymakers, activists, politicians, and industry experts to address the urgent challenge of climate change and seek sustainable solutions for a better future. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Made of Air. Uh, Made of Air is working on carbon negative materials. Uh, what we're doing, we've developed a technology that can functionalize biochar from being an agricultural product into an industrial material that can heavily decarbonize raw materials going into supply chains today. What we aim to do is to create carbon sinks in products. Um, and we're working in verticals like the built environment, which is my background, so I've been working in that space a long time, um, but also in logistics and automotive and all kinds of other material applications. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking about the area of carbon capture stores utilization. So taking a nature-based solution and turning, turning natural materials into something that can be used in the real world. Now, this is obviously something that is been, that's been talked about an awful lot, and it's been talked about as being something that is necessary for, for net zero. Give it to us straight. Is net zero possible without large-scale carbon capture and storage? Short answer, no. Uh, negative emissions technologies have been declared by the IPCC since the Paris Agreement um, to be needed to overcorrect the, the lack of pathways or the lack of time more that we have to be able to lower our emissions enough to be able to meet our target. And uh, negative emissions technologies, what are they? They're just technologies that can take more CO2 out of the air than they emit. The one that we're currently working with is biochar. Um, I can quickly explain what that is. We are taking waste biomass. Uh, so you can imagine small wood chips, sawdust, these residues from agriculture. Uh, they're converted into biochar, which is a form of, of charcoal. And in that conversion, we're actually taking the CO2 that's stored in that biomass and converting it into elemental carbon. And this is a globally verified carbon removal process. Uh, we desperately need more of these technologies. Um, I think the, the most important point is that we need a negative emissions technologies to be able to overcorrect, um, but we also need them to go into use. And I think that's different uh, with what we are doing. We are hearing a lot about direct air capture. We're hearing about CCUS. Uh, we hear about biochar. And those are wonderful technologies in the sense that they're taking CO2 out of the air and they're finding a pathway to the ground. Uh, we believe at Made of Air that there needs to be a disruption to our current system and that that kind of very simple model of taking it from the air to the ground does not go and disrupt the current system that we have. Um, we believe that carbon removal could go into utilization cycles and thereby do more in terms of emissions reduction. Well, when most of us think about carbon capture stores, emissions, we think of big industrial processes. We think of big machines sucking, uh, filtering out the air, or we think of big machines taking carbon and like, sticking it under the ground. What I really love about your business is that it's 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 taking things into the cities and it's making it into something that is that is real, that's tangible within our, within our own worlds, and it's also traceable. We know where the, where the carbon that you've taken is. It's in that wall over there. And that wall comes down, you know, you know where it is. Um, what is the role of, of uh, carbon capture stores and your technologies in the circular economy? Yeah, I mean, use is a big point. So what we're doing is uh, providing practical, tangible materials to companies that have supply chains that are currently buying high emitting materials like aluminum, like plastics, uh, and don't see a lot of alternatives to make a change. So most of the companies that we're working with are um, they're Let's give an example of plastics. Um, their biggest bet right now in terms of reaching a low carbon material in their supply chain is to increase the uh, volume of recycled plastics. 
Uh, we know from the OECD that by 2070, the amount, of, the volume of uh, recycled plastics that we will have globally is about 17%. So there's a disconnect happening between that thinking, that purchasing, and the, the actual levers that these companies believe they have to be able to reach a net zero pathway. So we believe in use. Uh, what we do is bring bring actual carbon. We bring biochar into materials. We can create a carbon sink. We create negative emissions that they can count on. And we also can mitigate the problem of that material. So we can actually cut their dependency on generating new fossil materials to do it. Fantastic. And uh, what's cooking in your lab? What's, uh, what, uh, what are you excited about announcing in the in year future? Uh, so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, what we've been working on in the last 12 to 24 months is, um, is patenting and biochar functionalization. Um, biochar, we love biochar because it's inert. Um, we love it because it's not going to re-release CO2 back into the atmosphere for a thousand years. What we don't love about an inert material is it doesn't stick to anything else. So in our lab, what we've been focusing on is activating the surface of biochar to get it to be able to bond, perform mechanically better, and to be able to increase the volume that we can store in existing materials. And that functionalization piece is uh, it's, it's just really eye-opening. And I'll link it back because it's not just about what we're doing. I think bioresources have become a big topic. Um, as you see companies and industries cutting the cord to fossil, where are they going to go to get the materials they need? They're going to go to bio. We have a lot of bio resources, but we don't have enough technologies that will bring those resources to materials. And I think um, what I'm seeing in our own lab in Berlin is just one example of how we can functionalize and operationalize those resources into actually useful materials. Mm, fantastic. And knowing how important uh, carbon capture and storage is and knowing how much of an emphasis that governments around the world, and like particularly in copper, are placing upon this, uh, you'd imagine the regulatory environment is really friendly and supportive. Is that true? <laughs> uh, you know, it's <laughs> regulating industry. Uh, you know, I'm not a policy person, um, but there are two pieces that I think Europe is doing quite well right now that I could talk about. Um, CRCF, uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with that. It's a carbon removal climate framework, I believe is what it stands for. And really, that's just, it's really just acknowledging the permanence and the laying the groundwork for incentive structure around all carbon removal technologies. So direct air capture, CCUS, um, biochar. And that piece of policy, while it's still early, it's starting to set up the carbon, um, the carbon value, the carbon credit system around these sort of highly efficient, longer term um, carbon removal strategies. And then the other one I really like, which I don't think is talked about enough, is CSRD. So um, this supply chain reporting, I feel like the what we've seen is it, it's like a rock is being lifted on on so many problems. When you have to report on your supply chain emissions. Um, I think companies really feel a lot of pressure. They're going to be named and shamed. If they've been greenwashing, they can't anymore. And it's a real opportunity to level the market. Um, we, One of our customers was in real estate. They're really um, thinking about how they're going to report as early as January next year about the emissions that are coming into all the built projects they're doing. And they're quite excited because they can actually show that the practices they've had in place for years are legit and their competitors are are not. So I think it's going to be a real awakening next year for that. Yeah, very good. Well, I think it's only fair to be looking at the other side of uh, of carbon capture and capture and storage as well. And um, there have been a series of critiques. Uh, some people have very loudly been saying that this is that this is all just it's a nonsense. It'll never work. It's just being used as an excuse uh, for the fossil fuel industry to continue the lifespan of doing doing what they're doing because they have the pollution in the hope that there'll be that this will be produce some sort of techno fix at some stage in the future. And what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, um, it's not wrong. I think that's a fair critique. Um, when we started out working in biochar, we were so excited about the idea of a carbon negative technology, a carbon negative material. Um, and we found that it, it was at COP15 
Uh, we found that the conversation at COP15 would not address negative emissions technologies until afterward. And they told us, and, and many of us who are lobbying for that, um, we don't want to enable, we don't want to make sure, you know, we don't want to give a free pass for oil and gas, for example, to keep going. I think I've changed my position on that a little bit. Uh, it angered me. I still feel like it's uh, carbon removal. It does give a free pass. Um, it does operate as a take it out of the air and put it in the ground and create a credit and someone can buy that credit. And then they're off and running doing what they're, what they've already been doing for years and years. Um, where I think it doesn't ring true anymore is use. I think when we start to see carbon removal processes like biochar, or like DAC, going into use, mitigating emissions, getting real engagement with companies, with industry where they're purchasing actual materials or they're, they're changing up actual processes, I think this is really where it has staying power and that's where the future of it will go. Yeah, and it might also be fair to make the distinction between a kind of the nature-based solutions, which you're talking about, and the large industrial processes. Do you see a future for the large industrial processes? Do you think it's, it is realistic to think that we can be just filtering air and trying to save ourselves that way? <laughs> <laughs> I would make the distinction in carbon removal between CCUS mm -hmm. and, uh, and biochar. I can just talk about those two. So CCUS, when you're, and there's a particular kind of CCUS, which I think is judged a little more, is, is different. Um, when you're capturing from flu um, and you are then claiming that, car, that reduced emission back as an oil and gas, for example, mm. I think this is problematic. You know, this is, this is where you're not really creating a negative emissions technology. This is where you're creating a free pass. Um, I think with biochar and, and some of the other technologies going on, I think there's, yeah, there's, there's more room to grow, I think, in those spaces. For sure, yeah. Yeah, and that is the, the depressing part of this market, that the most successful carbon capture um, technology so far haven't attached to existing oil and gas fields, and that's yeah, very depressing. But anyway, we'll move along. One of the other um, criticisms or pot potential um, hurdles towards nature-based uh, carbon capture and storage and biochar is the risk of monocultures where instead of promoting biodiversity, um, what we're going in is we're taking down existing forests and we're putting up kind of fast-growing willow or something like that just to create a, a, a chain, uh, like a, a manufacturing chain for biochar. But we end up losing a lot of nature, a lot of biodiversity as a result. Um, how do you assess that risk within your own uh, supply chain? Yeah, I think it's important to think about where our biomass streams are right now um, to be able to set the stage for that. The, the, and there is this risk, of course. Um, but what's happening right now, it is a value-based economy already. So when we're talking about wood waste versus agricultural waste in the field, um, these all have different values associated with them. Wood is actually uh, one of the only commodities that is not doesn't have a fixed price on an exchange. It's a highly cyclical market, and it's highly dependent on things like climate disaster or a global supply chain breakdown. So we are already kind of responding to um, biomass waste streams uh, as, a, as a market. The future of this, when we talk about biochar, uh, we have to be more careful. Of course, like woody biomass has more carbon. So there is this tendency to think that we will create a super tree that will have the most carbon efficient uptake and we'll be using all of that for biochar and every farmer will be making that because the price point will be right. And I think it's important to say that we we need an economy that is um, that is value based, that is cheap and plentiful across the globe, and needs variety. Um, our process needs variety as well. We have inputs like wood waste, but we also look at coconut shells and rice hulls, bamboo, etc. And I think one of the ways that we prevent the risk that you're talking about is by looking back at our history. So in the last 70 years, we've been in a fossil economy. And at all costs, um, we've been extremely efficient at extracting those resources from below ground. As we see this shift go toward above ground resources, we are going to have to think differently about what those costs are. So we don't drive that process with only the sort of financial shallow cost in mind, but taking on board the other costs that we're talking about as we do it. 
So I think there is a kind of global sign up to that that will create more of a, um, a stabilizing effect when we talk about biomass waste. Fantastic, Alison. Thank you so much. I think if we, if you're absolutely right, if we can just use the resources that we have, stop wasting, we can make a huge amount of progress and uh, biochar will make a very big impact in this. So could you, would you mind uh, thanking Alison for yes. a wonderful contribution? Thank you so here? much. Thank you. Oh.